Hello, everyone, and welcome. So, so far today, we've heard a conversation with Jean-Marc Savé helping us understand how France's Independent Commission on Sexual Abuse came about, what the major findings of the report were, and what needs to happen now. We then heard from a panel of global experts who discussed the similarities and differences between the French findings and findings from their own countries and attempted to provide an analysis of the strengths and weaknesses of each approach and what we need to do going forward. And now we're gonna talk with a group of noted women experts in the church. We'll discuss what might have been different had women had a seat at the table earlier in the process, what the findings of the French report and other reports on clergy abuse mean for women going forward, and how women can help lead the church's cultural transformation in the months and years to come. We've brought together a remarkable group of leaders for this conversation. Paulina Guzik is a journalist for TVP, the public broadcaster in Poland. She hosts a weekly Sunday news program covering the church in Poland and the world. She also writes for Crux and Vise in Poland, covering the sexual abuse crisis in the church extensively. She's been here in the United States for the past semester researching a book on this subject. Paula Kampner is a survivor of clergy sexual abuse. She's currently the Outreach Coordinator of Restorative Justice and Abuse Prevention in the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis. And she works to coordinate restorative justice opportunities throughout the Archdiocese and meets with survivors to offer support and healing on their journeys. Gloria Purvis is the host of the Glorious Pur Gloria Purvis podcast from America Media. She's appeared in various media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, PBS NewsHour, and many others. And she hosted Morning Glory, an international radio show. She's a consultant to the U.S. bishops, the Maryland Catholic Conference, the Archdiocese of Washington, and is truly an American Catholic leader. Dr. Jennifer S. Wortham is a religion, spirituality, and forgiveness research associate at the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard University's Institute for Quantitative Social Science, and she's the founder and chair of the Global Collaborative for Child Sexual Abuse Prevention, Healing, and Justice. In 2019, she authored a memoir on clergy sexual abuse titled A Letter to the Pope, The Keeper of the Nest. So before we get started talking to these wonderful women, I want to thank all of you who are joining us for this discussion, and also just one more thanks to our partners who were involved in bringing this together. Of course, Georgetown's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, our initiative on Catholic social thought and public life here at Georgetown, the Office of Mission and Ministry, as well as Georgetown Law's Office of Mission and Ministry, the Collaborative on Global Children's Issues, and the Human Flourishing Project at Harvard University's Institute for Quantitative Social Science. One more quick note that this dialogue is being recorded and live streamed and that in the last 15 minutes of our time together, we'll answer questions from the audience. And please join that conversation by opening the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen and typing in your question. So now let's start this good conversation. I'd like to ask each of you in turn to answer the same opening question, and then we'll get back to each one of you for a longer conversation. Paul, I'd love to start with you. Why is it important to lift up women's voices in the church, and what might have been different had women been given a seat at the table earlier in the process? Um, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, thank you for all of you who are attending. I, I think the lack of meaningful roles for women in the church um, really points a, a bleak picture for the entire church. Um, if the role of women are not, is not taken seriously, they're continuing to lose out on the unique gifts of, of women. Um, some such gifts are, you know, tenderness, wisdom, insight, intuition, warmth, love, support, education, and the unique experiences of being a woman. That's- Thank you so much. Thanks, Paula. That's a great way to get us started. Gloria, yeah. how about you? Uh, what's your reaction to this question? Why is it important to lift up women's voices here? What might have been different if women had had a seat at the table earlier in this process? I mean, we're half of the human family. Humanity cannot exist without women. And it's, it's surprising to me that we wouldn't think that we'd be missing something if half of what makes us human is completely missing. I mean, it's not just men alone that are human. And so that to me is fundamentally, I'm like, you're missing half of humanity. It's an incomplete conversation without our voices, just mm -hmm. as creation would be incomplete if women were not here, if we didn't exist. We are fully a part of God's plan. And so to have our voices not there in a meaningful way, to me means they cannot really have 
conversations that can expect to address this problem. Um, and I think if women were present, there's no way you can tell me if mothers, grandmothers, sisters, and aunts weren't, were present when they were having these conversations about the abuse crisis, that we wouldn't have said, wait a minute, what about the victim? And also because specifically as women, we move through the world sexually vulnerable. So we have a perspective just in terms of how we move about the world that's invaluable to these conversations. Thanks so much for that, Gloria. Jennifer, how about you? What's your reaction to these questions? What might have been different if women had been at the table? Your reaction to what you've heard so far? Well, I, you know, I can I can look back at the context of my family and um, and my grandmother, who was um, who helped build the church that we that we worshipped in. Unfortunately, where my brothers ended up being um, being abused. And um, I, I, I may have had a little different experience in terms of how women were engaged, but she was at the table in, in so many ways um, in her church and, and, and you know, she, she was on committees and um, choirs and she, she was very, very engaged in the church. Um, and, and I, at the time was naive. I didn't realize that there was really a big distinction other than the priest gave communion, but, um, but, but fortunately we had that opportunity to be engaged. Um, and, and yet there was still um, abuse. My brothers were, were abused. Um, so I, I think women's voices, I concur completely with what everybody else has said, but um, I don't wanna lose the fact that there are, there, are, there are churches, there are places where women's voices are, are heard and are being heard. Um, I know there's parts of the world, and when we look at cultural differences, that that's very that is very different experience. Um, but I think we have made some progress in the United States in bringing women um, closer um, in, in church decisions. Not yet far enough. I think we 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 definitely need to see women in 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 some type of ministry positions going forward. But um, you know we we are making some progress here in the U.S. And I think there are many women. Who, who have made major contributions to the church as well. Um, but uh, I, you know, I can't say that, that evil would not happen if, if, if a woman was, was present. I, I, I can only say that that did happen with my family. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Jennifer. How about you, Paulina? What's your reaction to what you've heard so far and your reaction to this question? Would there have been something different? What would have been different if women had a seat at the table earlier in the process? And maybe your experience on this from Poland as well, given that we've just talked about different issues across cultures. Yeah, thank you so much at the beginning for having me in this panel. I feel honored to be in the panel with such excellent women uh, here today. And um, well, let me give you my perspective. And my soul is split between uh, a part of a soul as a journalist and a part of the soul as an academic researching the problem. Uh, so I'll start with the journalist perspective. So, uh, you know, journalists, and of course the journalist perspective is always a bit more pessimistic. As journalists, you know, when we smell roses, we look for the coffin. And that was uh, exactly what um, I did with the so-called Dominican case in Poland, uh, about which I'll tell you maybe later a little bit more. But I listened to survivors in that particular case that were not heard for 20 years. And because they, they have not been heard for 20 years, um, another woman, a nun, was abused. So, uh, you know, the, the people who didn't listen to them take responsibility for a broken life. They re take responsibility before church, take responsibility before God, take responsibility uh, before the justice system. So I think it's important to listen to the, uh, you know, voices of women uh, because there are so many voices out there that have not been heard yet. Um, so we need to listen to them so that cases are uncovered. That's A. Uh, the more optimistic uh, side of, uh, you know, my perspective is an academic side. I came from Poland here to the U.S. Uh, to research mostly communications about sexual abuse, but I talked to many VAX survivors, uh, uh, you know, victims assistants like Pola here. And I find that in the U.S. it's just amazing how much role of not only women but laity has got here in the church in the US. And it really changed the perspective with all the qualities that Paula mentioned. And, and for me, engaging women, it's not about equality, you know, and it's not about um, complaining that we don't have a role. 
it's about the qualities, as Paula mentioned, that, that women can bring. And I think it really brought change to the table here in the US. Well, I couldn't agree more that there are so many women here in the US uh, making such a difference and working on the ground and, and, and really doing so much on this issue. And I'd like to turn now for a conversation in a little more detail first to one of them. Paula, let's talk with you. I mean, you really are out there you there, Paulina mentioned that there are so many voices that haven't been heard yet. You're out there listening to those voices. Tell us a little bit about your background, about your work uh, in the Archdiocese of Minneapolis and St. Paul and how you got involved with this, the work you do today, and why are those survivors' voices important to keep front and center? I'm so sorry, I keep forgetting. Um, you know, my background is theology and education, and I've worked in the church um, in parishes for over 40 years as an adult educator. And I'm also a survivor of clergy sexual, emotional, and verbal abuse. And I wanted to be specific. And as a, a someone, a lay person working in the church, there is emotional and verbal abuse um, from the higher ups, so to speak. Um, I started programming in, in my previous parish um, in raising the awareness for the people in the pews. And I started bringing in speakers about the topic. Um, we had discussion groups. How has this affected you? We talked about how we would go about healing, um, who we knew were survivors and how we could um, virtually help them. And, um, you know, we started, you know, so I, I was working at that. and. One of the directors of ministerial standards and, be, um, and safe environment um, contacted me and asked me if I would apply for a, a brand new position. And it's, it's different than a VAC. It's different than, from a victim assistance coordinators. I work strictly with the victim survivors themselves. I listen to their stories day after day after day. And one of the things I was, I was thinking just a couple of weeks ago was the bishop should be here listening to all these stories. You know, I think it's impossible to understand truly what sexual abuse is and does to a human person unless you've experienced it. And for them to listen and listen and listen is the only way that they are going to understand as much as they can what lives have been absolutely decimated by this. Um, you know, in my experience, the primary function of the hierarchical church is self-preservation. They wanna protect themselves as an institution and as a power structure. That is the culture in the church today. Um, it's, it's come somewhat you know, a distance since Vatican Council too, but it's 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 has a more of a journey um, to make in regards to this, as we all know. Um, you know, I, I and I, you know, as someone mentioned in one of the panels, was, you know, when I listen to these stories every day, I have experienced. I've been in this position about two and a half years, and I have experienced tremendous horror. I've been paralyzed by these stories. Um, there was a two month period last year where I was just numb from hearing the most horrific stories that nobody could make up of what these perpetrators did to the victims. And I have to step back and seek help for myself and reach out to people that I know can support me, other people doing this ministry. Um, there's just, there's just so much that happens, you know, when, when you're working in the church, um, especially with clergy, they're so threatened by a lay person's presence. They're threatened with our education and with our life experience. They're very threatened by that. My husband used to work for the church. He would never let the parish priest, the pastor know his level of education because he was so threatened by it. 
So I don't know if I'm going off topic, but go not ahead. at all. That's that's wonderful, and that's that's wonderful to hear. I want to pick up on one thing you said. You talked about how listening to victim survivors really is something that leads to a conversion of heart. And we heard about that in the prior panel. Yeah. We heard about that earlier today as well, the need for the conversion of heart for all of this to move forward. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about what we heard earlier today, how the findings of the French report and other reports on clergy abuse, what does that mean for women going forward, for the church going forward, for survivors especially, and what lessons can we draw from these kinds of findings? You know, the French report, I, I spent time reading it again this morning, and it, it overwhelmed me. It was so well done. But in my experience of being on the ground day in and day out, I, I wonder how much of it can be achieved. You know, it's not going to be in my lifetime. It's probably not going to be in yours. Um, it, it's a long road ahead of us. I think because this culture is really um, just ingrained in the DNA of the hierarchy. It's just ingrained from what I can see um, and experience. It's not every one of them, but it's more than I think we think there is. Um, you know, there's just a trend in, you know, the, the formation of the seminarians. Um, I go in once a year to talk to the seminarians about victims and how to respond to victim survivors when they disclose. Because in my experience, there's been so much damage done in the re-victimization of the survivors, just re-victimizing. One shared the other night in one of our support groups, you know, she went, she decided to go to confession and she shared that she was a survivor. And the priest told her, get over it. Just get over it. You know, and she really, I was so glad to hear this. She just let him have it, so to speak. I mean, she really came back to him and said, you have no idea what I've been through. You don't know who I am. You don't know the struggle in just sitting here before you. You don't get it. And how dare you judge me like that? And, you know, we all need to say those things. You know, we all need to say, you know, don't judge us until you've walked in our shoes. Um, you know, there's a lack of form formation for the seminary. They're, it's almost like they're, they're formed in this bubble and they're unable to think outside the box. Um, there's a lack of relationship skills, poor communication skills, a lack of any, um, of being informed about trauma in their lives and abuse of all kinds. There's a lack of that. There's not enough. Going in once a year or twice a year is not enough. Um, there's a general fear of abuse victims, believe it or not. Um, not only just the lawsuits, but not knowing how to respond and what to say. Um, another survivor shared the other night that, you know, she, her pastor ignored her when she found out, when he found out about her abuse just totally ignored her while other priests supported her. And she finally sat him down and said, what is going on? He said, I just didn't know what to say. And my response to that and to the seminarians was, if you don't know what to say, tell them that you don't know what to say. What is it that you need from me right now? Do you want me to just listen? You know, they first want to be believed, ask what they need. You know, listen, 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 and then listen some more. You know, be willing to enter onto the, into the sacred covenant with them by standing with them, knowing we are all victims, but and sharing our pain together. Um, Jesus cultivated trust. Can we do any less? What a wonderful, we, what a wonderful way to talk about it. I don't mean to, to cut you yeah. off. Please go ahead and finish. Mm -hmm. no. Uh, but just to end on that idea of, of trust and how important that is, right? And what a story. I mean, that just hits me. It hits me in my gut. And I, you talk about culture being ingrained, this culture being ingrained and how do we push against it? Um, and I just wonder if you're seeing a sort of change in that culture then. And then I'd like to go to you, Paulina, and talk a little bit about that too. Paula, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Let us know. Do you see a change in that culture coming? You know, I, I see a change in our archdiocese. Um, our bishop is very, 
very relational. And he meets with every victim, every victim who asks to meet with them. I know that there are so many bishops who refuse to meet with victims. And I think it's out of fear of a lot of things, you know, a lot of different things. And, you know, there's a difference when, you know, they, they're willing to sit and listen. It's just so different for them, you know, and it, and it teaches them, you know, they need to listen to the bishops who do, you know, respond to, to victim survivors. I think that's, you know, someone needs to be willing to hold the victim's pain and hurt. And someone needs to be there for them when they wonder where God is in all of this, in their anger and sadness. And someone needs to be there to celebrate their growth and resilience when it happens. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and Paulina, I wanna to turn to you now because I think we talk about this in grain culture in the church. And something that I always feel it's important to say is that journalists have been essential journalists who are outside the church, just essential to uncovering the clergy abuse crisis and the clerical culture which permitted it and hid sex abuse. I think of the National Catholic Reporter, I think of the Boston Globe, so many others. Um, so Catholic journalists, secular journalists, we just owe a great debt of gratitude to journalists for covering this. So you are a journalist, you've done extensive reporting on research on this issue. Tell us a little bit about your work, a little bit more about what's going on in Poland, about what it's like to report on these issues as a woman. Well, it's not easy. It's probably like Spotlight 20 years ago here in the US. Um, so, and of course, Spotlight is still quoted and very much quoted these days in Poland. So let me tell you a, bit, a little bit about the background, uh, just briefly. So in 2018 in Poland, the crisis really hit. This was our Spotlight moment with the documentary by the Sikielski brothers, Tell No One. And since then, the cases were emerging mostly those reported by the media. So the media plays an important role in uncovering the cases. I reported ex extensively on the Dominican case, uh, which uh, very briefly, 20 years ago, a friar uh, abused a group of women, uh, vulnerable adults at the youth ministry. He wasn't properly punished. There was no canonical trial and a nun was abused. Um, several years um, ago because he wasn't punished. Um, now, this case is a very grim case, not only for the Dominicans, but also for the society. Um, well, let me tell you that the first article that I wrote, so it was like, you know, extensive fact checking, a very long article in March. But then the other one I wrote in July 2021 to just show the emotions of um, of those women, you know, the, to show their broken lives, uh, to show how they were impacted by the abuse. You know, some didn't finish the university, some marriages broken, some were forced by the abuse to go to the convent because that was the discern that the friar made for them. And then they left the convent and they have nothing. So I wrote a piece in July about their pain and their suffering. And the major journalist of, in Poland, like a star of all, wrote his editorial. And let me quote two sentences from this editorial. First is, criminal law doesn't forbid two people to sleep together, even if one is a priest and the other is a nun. It shows the fundamental misunderstanding in our society, what abuse really is. The other quote was questioning uh, my journalistic abilities. Throughout the article, emotions flow, and at the end, they splash so hard, they cover the facts. Well, this was published in the major secular newspaper in Poland. And what does it say? It says that, um, I mean, I felt when I read it that I'm really on a mission. You know, Pope Francis called us to be missionaries. And that's what I feel being a woman journalist in Poland, to, that bringing emotions to the table talking about sexual abuse is exactly our role. It's the women's role because we understand um, emotions there. And it's impossible to, you know, to just write the, the simple facts and then not write about emotions when you're writing about this. So I think this is one of the qualities of us, of us women uh, to bring to the table that emotions are very important because it's emotions that, you know, bring the person to report at first hand, you know? So, so the emotional side of it for me is, is very, very important. And of course I'll stay, you know, objective I'll, I'll search for the facts, you know, I'll, um, I'll do everything in my power to check facts, but emotions are important in this subject. 
Thanks so much, Paulina. And I want to jump off of that a little bit. If you would talk a little bit about the cultural differences between local churches in different countries in responding to the crisis and how that might affect our response. So is the church in Poland prepared to respond to this crisis? And what differences have you found here in the United States? And I wonder how we can work across those differences towards accountability and responsibility and reform and ultimately justice. So uh, Poland is in a very difficult position because there is only a handful of wonderful people, but only a handful of them who are really working uh, very, you know, dedicated on uh, on the crisis. So there is the primate's office, the delegate of child protection of the bishop's conference and his team. There is a wonderful lay woman that is leading the, um, the foundation of St. Joseph, Martha Titanius, who that is helping the victims, that is paying for their therapy. So it's a great initiative of the Polish Bishops' Conference. Uh, but there is not much more than that. I mean, of course we have the VAX, but 99% of the VAX, I would say, are priests, which means that many victims wouldn't come to them only because there is a collar there and there is lack of trust to the institution. Uh, so we need lay people to get more involved in Poland, definitely. And what I found fascinating here in the US is that most of the VAX are lay people and most of them are women. There are amazing, uh, you know, victims assistance coordinators uh, in diocese through, from LA to St. Paul and Minneapolis, New York, um, uh, Chicago, you know, I mean, Boston, there are, there are so many places to, to pick where laity played an important role and we can really learn uh, from each other. Now, when I came here to the US, I was really kind of, you know, scratching my head, why the bishops didn't come here years ago, you know, why they didn't learn about your, uh, your way of doing things, you know, about the best practices that are really here on the table that other churches can learn from. And I'm not only talking about the church in Poland, I'm talking about, for instance, the church in Spain. I mean, El País, LA, newspapers had to start a hotline, you know, for the a phone line for, for the abuse victims in the church because the church didn't even pick up the problem. I mean, the church in Spain, we're talking about a Catholic country for centuries. So it's it really is a global problem and we can learn from the US experience. And, and I think it's a it's, it's an amazing place to learn. And I know that many Americans listen to me maybe are not so optimistic, uh, but you've, you had this change and you've had your, you know, your, your learning points and you really learned the lesson in many, many, um, many, many areas. Thanks so much for that, Paulina. And, and that's a good segue to you, Jennifer, and then we'll go to Gloria. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience, your background, how you got involved in this issue and the work you do today, and maybe your reactions to what Paulina said as well. Yeah, thank you, Paulina. I, I, I really honor and respect what you have said in the progress. I, I, I want to recognize all the women who made so many contributions in the United States and, and in other parts of the world, um, and that our voices are, are starting to be heard. Um, my, my, uh, my journey started with a letter to Pope Francis about, um, about what my family had experienced and my, my, reconcilia my personal reconciliation with the church. And um, I, I think that um, uh, the response that I was able to to, to see him, I, it was a, it was one of those uh, apparently a one in a million uh, opportunities to kind of get a letter, and it got to him. And um, and so um, I I was really grateful for for the opportunity to see Pope Francis and to 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 it was it's a brief meeting, but um, to have that 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 closure for myself from a, a spiritual transformation. Um, and then I, I came back and felt like I needed to do something more and that, um, that, that there really needed to be some transformation and change in, in the church and in, in the way that um, fam families and victims were, were, were dealt with. Um, and I felt like as a, as a woman, um, I, I could have a, I had a unique perspective to bring and maybe some unique learnings as well. Um, and so I wrote another letter to him. And that time I didn't hear back. Um, it was uh, uh, several months went, months went by. And uh, so I did some research to find out who was running the commission and found Cardinal O'Malley's office and started sending him letters. Um, and it took me three or four letters to actually get through and to get a meeting um, with him. And so I, and I, I'll just say, it's kind of a running joke that um, it's harder to get a meeting with Cardinal O'Malley than it was to get one with Pope Francis. <laughs> 
so he's very busy and in a way it's a mixed it's a mixed bag i mean he's he runs probably the the, the running the commission is it just clearly was all that they've had to do with the last three world. You can see why, why he's so incredibly busy, but he's been very generous and kind with his time and support um, of, of my work. And, um, and, you know, I, I, I've just been on an amazing journey since my first meeting um, with Pope Francis. And I, I, I will say that, um, that it didn't come easy and that I've had to knock on doors and continue knocking on doors and continue knocking on doors. And, um, and I think that's one of the things women bring to the table is we can be persistent and we can be a voice um, for those, those who, who are not able to do it. I was never a mother. Um, I, I, um, I cannot relate with the women here who were mothers. Unfortunately, I can relate as womanhood, but um, I, I, can only, I can only know how difficult it must be in having watched my mother um, suffer for, for so many years um, with, with, with the knowledge that her sons were abused and that their, their lives were destroyed. And so, um, so I'm fighting, I'm fighting on behalf of my, my entire family. And, um, and I'm, I'm really determined and not going to give up until we've transformed um, the way the church deals with, with this issue. And, um, and I think we all, I think all of us have a role to play. Men have a role to play. Women have a role to play. Um, we, we really, um, can we can make change happen? I'm I'm convinced of it. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for sharing that, Jennifer. Uh, and and your meeting with with Pope Francis. That's wonderful. I wonder if you could tell us your reaction to what we've heard today. Your the findings of the French report and other reports on clergy abuse. Um, what does it mean for us going forward for survivors? What kind of institutional protections do you think we should put in place? And what kind of lessons should we take from these reports? Well, you know, I come from the healthcare industry, and um, and the healthcare industry, and there is a parallel. We we had in um, early two thousand a report came from the Institutes of Medicine about a hundred thousand people every year lost their life needlessly because of errors um, in and in, uh, in things that were preventable, and um, and and when you look at that loss of life, there were many more people that were injured, and we had a structure here in the United States that was very kind of patriarchal and very high. You know, where the physician could not be challenged and could not be questioned, and um, and there was the institution of um, practices uh, as a result of all that, based on learnings from other industries that were that had. Um, uh, uh, highly sensitive operations like the nuclear power industry and the, and the aviation industry, they had many, many more customers flying through the air every year with, with not that kind of accidents or injuries. So the healthcare industry went on a journey to learn what, what, um, what those other industries had um, done as practices to make the environment a safer place. And what they learned is um, a very important component is of, of what they call a just culture, where uh, everyone has a voice and um, nobody's voice is quelched. And, um, and they, they, they worked over 10 years to implement um, practices to create just cultures in hospitals where physicians were no longer the only person with the voice. And there was a tremendous transformation as a result. And, and, um, and now that it's a global, it's in over 3,600 hospitals in the United States, and now it's a kind of a global program. So we can learn from uh, institutional practices that are done and how to create safer environments, how to promote environments and systems that, um, that give everyone a voice. But you also have to put in the structures um, so that those voices have a place to go, and um, and then and then have audits and do reporting. And so there's there's a, um, a an entire model that that we're going to be looking to to um, to recommend. Um, and then you have to provide training um, and counseling um, and leadership um, and and uh, and help the the issue the bishops and others who are leading these organizations. Um, to understand the, the dynamics of leadership that are going to be important to make sure that the voices that are, are brought to the table are acted on accordingly. So I, I think if we really look at taking a systemic approach um, and, and, and pull from the experiences of other industries and, um, and make these models um, successful, I think I think we'll have um, some success in starting to address this issue. And I, I know we're running short on time, but I I do want to say that prevention is critical, but healing is very essential. And um, and knowing where my family is and the experiences, my brothers are still very traumatically impacted every aspect of their life. And um, and uh, and we need help. We need help from the church to help with healing. So 
Um, so that, that's, I think, my, my final piece of advice on that. Thanks so much for that. I, it reminds me of so much of the good work of organizations like Leadership Roundtable and others, and there's so much work to be done. Uh, so thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, Gloria, I'd like to turn to you now. You are a prominent woman leader in the U.S. church. What's been your experience as a Black woman in a U.S. church led largely by white men, and why do you think it's important to diversify decision-making in the church to include the voices of women in particular? So I think my experience as a Black woman in a church is largely led by white men probably is very different in the sense that I converted at age 12. Um, I attended a Catholic school that was basically all Black. The parish I went to once I converted at age 12 was all Black had a black priest, a black deacon. My first introduction to anybody um, that I knew was Catholic was a black religious sister and a habit. So I had a, uh, an experience of the church in my early years that made me believe that the church, I, was, I fully belonged and I didn't need anyone's permission. I was not an outsider. Um, and I think there's something to that of having had such a, a all black pretty much experience of Catholicism as a young person. Um, that always made me feel like I had a voice, I belonged, I didn't need permission, um, and also the, the kinds of expressions of worship that were very just common to me. I didn't understand until later when I, when I left that little bubble that I was like, oh, that's not really like the church in the United States. But having had that experience, it's always made me feel um, okay to say what I thought you know, whether I'm talking to clergy or laity or whomever, black or white or Asian, whatever, I always felt it was okay for me to say what I thought because this church is fully, I'm a member of it. I am fully a member of the Catholic church, which is Christ's church and Christ came from me. So that having that experience and that sort of base gave me a, I, I guess, a boldness that people typically would not expect me to have. Um, and um, I think it's actually been quite helpful to me um, and, and made the church a place for me of mine, safeness, I guess. Um, now, in terms of why women, diversity, diversifying voices in the church, uh, if, if I'm not misunderstanding your second question, then that's right. I think it's actually important that we have people outside the reach of the clergy. I mean, honestly, I think it's because I think there's more of a freedom to speak, say, and act when your entire life is not able to be negatively impacted by the men in power. And so there's a freedom with, okay, I'm gonna say my piece and understand if I'm not in this leadership position. And I'm also talking about women being in leadership positions, decision-making positions that they're like, you know what? I'm going to say and do what I believe is best. And you realize there is no real long lasting consequence to your life. Okay, maybe you are out of a job, but guess what? You can work outside the church, you know what I mean? Without a problem, you don't have the same kind of handcuffs, if you will, the clergy do have. Um, and so I think we have a certain freedom in that regard that, that clergy don't have and that women do have. And I also think we need to be in positions of leadership and decision-making because it conveys a message to the rest of the world. It conveys a message to those perhaps victims that, hey, there's somebody that is outside of that clerical culture that can hear me and they can make a decision on my behalf. Because believe me, there is a clerical culture, Kim. There absolutely is. And so as much as we can be free from that, as much as we um, also have a different perspective as, as men and also people that don't live in that clerical culture, we bring something that is vital, that is absolutely vital for leadership and decision-making. Well, I want to pick up on something you just said about the clerical culture, Gloria. As a journalist, advisor, commentator, you followed this issue of clergy sexual abuse closely over the past several years at least. What are the most important lessons you've drawn, and in particular res regarding responding to that clerical culture? Oh my goodness, we can never stop asking enough questions. I mean, we learned so much out of the McCarrick scandal. We were like, wait a minute, you mean these whole guys were carved out? of even you know, being looked at or have these questions, that was, that was eye-opening and that was really enraging to a lot of uh, laity. A lot of people walked away from the church. They're like, what do you mean? We went through this in 2000, what was it, five? We went through this early on and now we're visiting this again and to find that you guys sort of exempted yourself out. Are you kidding me? And so we can never ask enough questions. We're realizing now that there's a lot of problems in seminary formation. When we started to learn that seminarians were 
abused. It, it sort of made me say, what happens in the seminary process that takes this umph out of these guys? You know, what happens with obedience that makes them so vulnerable to this kind of manipulation? So even the question about how are seminarians even formed? Are women even in seminaries and positions of teaching? You know, because these guys need to learn how to work to and listen to and take direction from women, from lay people. And so it's, I think we have to revisit just the whole, the whole way guys are formed for the priesthood. And, um, and then we had that recent case of the gentleman who was sentenced to a very long uh, criminal sentence for these abusive young boys. And he, I mean, he's a recent graduate of the seminary. And to come to see the way he behaved in the seminary made me say, did no one tell? Why was this not a red flag? What would his psychological profile look like? How could this guy have made it through? So yeah, there are a lot of questions we need to ask and how they're formed, how they are allowed when they're out after they are ordained and um, more that we as women, I think, can bring to helping to um, make things better, I guess. Thanks so much for that, Gloria. Paulina, I wanna go to you now. I know you have to leave. Paulina has been so generous with her time. She is literally going to catch a uh, plane back to Poland uh, after this. So we're gonna ask her one last question. And then I'm gonna take this question to the rest of you as well. Paulina, what do, you, what do we know about the scope of abusive women religious across the church and why is that a serious problem why don't we know more about it and then maybe you could give us your one takeaway so we can say goodbye yes so but let me start with actually you know uh picking up some voices of 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 uh the women that that spoke before me uh so it has been amazing to hear all of your experience and it actually brought my memories back to pope francis's let us dream he wrote there in this book with austin ivory that um, he, you know, hires women in the positions of the Vatican, not because of equality issues, but because um, he knows that women will bring change and how they will bring change with their multitasking as mothers, you know, as uh, the specialists in, in certain fields, as professionals. So he knows that a woman is able to gather all her experiences together to bring her experience at the table and in the topic that we discuss to help the church deal with the sexual abuse crisis. Someone uh, said in the Vatican, I think it was an American priest, um, uh, if you want to handle the abuse crisis, listen to mothers. So, and actually that's what brought me uh, to, to, to this issue, to this area. Uh, I have a lion, a lion pin uh, here with me because I feel like we're like lionesses, you know, protecting our herd a mother is never going to compromise. So we either protect our children or we're done, we're done with you. So uh, this is the approach that uh, the, the woman and, and the mother in my case uh, can have. The other thing that I would like to say about the French report is um, the, and I think it's, it's very important in the case that you, that you mentioned, Kim, the, the, you know, the nuns abused in convents, uh, the women religious that, that has been abused and didn't come forward yet. The French report searched for the people that were abused. They didn't just sit there and wait for the people to come. They searched for them. And this is exactly what we have to do with women religious. And this is, of course, I feel also a task of journalists. And of course, there is this excellent book of Salvador Echernuncio, um, Lifting the Veil of Silence, that is doing this job, that is lifting that veil of silence, because there is so much abuse out there in the convents. We don't have even an idea how much of it it is. And I think women have a certain role to play in this, uh, in this particular case, because, and I experienced that again with the Dominican case, those women wouldn't go to anyone but a woman. They wanted a woman to hear them. It was just so traumatizing for them. They wouldn't go to a man to tell what this priest did to them. So a woman to woman bond is needed so that those nuns go forward and, and tell the truth and tell about their abuse. So I think this is a particular role that, that women also have to play. And again, I'm coming back to the emotions. We need to understand emotions that are going with it because, uh, you know, the silence that is there is also covered with fear to, to, to come forward after, after, you know, a nun or a woman or whoever uh, was abused. So I think that we need to uncover that fear. And for that, we need care, we need assistance, we need a heart. So, so that th those emotions will, will make us 
you know, be in a better uh, place in the church when we when we listen to those that were heard. And I'm sorry, I have to run. I have to go with two of them, with my two kids to the airport and make it to Dallas. So thank you so much for for having me in this panel. And I, I really appreciate hearing all your voices. And thank you, Kim, for moderating. Thanks so much for joining us, Paulina, and thank you for your important, uh, important and powerful work. And uh, and it's been wonderful to have you here uh, for these few months. So safe travels. Thanks again for joining us. And I know I speak thank for everybody you. here on that. Um, thank Paula, you. Paula, well, see you later. Um, Paul, I'd like to turn to you now with this question. Do, can you talk to us a little bit about the scope of abuse of women religious? Um, and why that is a serious problem, why we don't know more about it, what you see where you are on this issue or abuse of women more generally. And I'm struck by something that, that Paulina said, which is that we need to go search. We can't just sit back and wait. I know I've heard you talk about that as well. Could you speak a little bit more to those issues? Sure. Um, when I went through my therapy, um, it was probably about 2002. And there were, we had a, a therapy group for those who were abused by priests and religious. And there were probably 12 of us in the group and three of them had been abused by sisters. Um, one in the school and two of them as adults in the religious life in their formation program. So they were a postulant or a novice in the religious order and um, the novice mistress would come in and say, this is part of your formation. This is part of your training. You need to go through this. Um, it, and it was appalling to me. It was, I, I grew up and many of my sisters were religious at one time. It, it just was appalling. And then I, as I went through the years, I heard of more and more um, victims of yeah. sisters and brothers um, as well. And I always feel like the next huge wave is going to be the religious, the men and women who abused. I really think, you know, the brothers and the sisters, the sisters in the schools. Um, you know, we know that many have experienced physical abuse by them, you know, in, in when we were children, but the sexual abuse, I think, is so rampant. And I think it's very difficult for victims, women and men, to come forward because it's, there's more embarrassment, there's more shame that a woman did this to me and they don't wanna share it. There's too much guilt and shame over it. It's, it, for some reason, you know, it, it's easier if it was a man that did it, you know, um, that it was a priest that did it. It just seems easier for some victims. So I think, you know, I think that we do need to encourage those victims to come forward. And I, I must say that the two victims I'm dealing with now, um, they're dealing with their religious orders and finding the same cover up, the exact same cover up. Well, that's that's a good jumping off point. Thanks so much for that contribution, Paula. And, and I wanna, first I wanna remind everybody that we're about to go to your questions. And so the way to get your questions in is to join this conversation, just open the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and just type in your question and we will try to get to as many as we can. Uh, but first, uh, Jennifer, I'd like to take this question to you that Paula was just speaking to. And in particular, we'll talk about the abuse of women, but I also want to talk about, you know, this idea that Paulina raised of you have to go uh, search for people, you can't just wait. I'm struck in your story about how much leaning into this you did, the letters you wrote, the persistence you had. Can you react to what you've heard from Paulina and Paula on that score? Yeah, I think it's very important that um, to be able to reach out uh, to victims, um, as Paulina said, um, to be proactive, to try to create safe spaces for people to come forward. Um, so I, I, I think that's very important. Um, I, I completely um, agree also with what Paula said about um, religious sisters. Um, sexual abuse is, 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 is not a, does not discriminate in terms of who the perpetrator is. Um, ultimately, it's, a, it's, a, it's an abuse of power. And so I, I don't want to get into a sexist conversation about who should have done what when. I think everybody is in positions of power are responsible. Um, they're responsible for creating the right culture, the safe culture. 
and for holding people accountable. And I think that's where I'd like to focus my time and attention is really on making sure that the vulnerable people have access to, um, to justice and, and that, that, uh, that there is accountability for all people, whether they're men or women, um, what level they're in at the church. Um, and, I, and I will also say that, um, that, that the lay community, the community of the faithful all also have a responsibility and, um, and there, there are, I, I was in a conversation and I, it was probably one of the things that disturbed me the most in my life. Um, I was in a conversation a few years ago with somebody driving to mass. She was taking me to her church for the first time. It, it was beautiful cathedral in Santa Paula. And on the way there, she was just questioning a lot about, you know, the, the clergy abuse victims. And, and she said, well, you know, my church, um, we, we don't want our money going to, 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 to victims. And so we have a special envelope that we put our money into. Um, it's a green envelope and that means it can only be spent on our church and it doesn't go to the diocese and none of our money can be taken by victims. And it really broke my heart. Um, my, my brothers each got $3,000 for counseling and their lives were completely destroyed. And so I look at the mm -hmm. community of the faithful also as having responsibility, men, women, um, I don't care if you're a janitor or a lawyer, who you are, um, we, we all make up the community of the church and we are all responsible for trying to make a change. Um, and I'm not going to say there's one person who's more powerless than the other. I, I, I made my voice heard and I continue, will continue to make my voice heard. And I've knocked on doors and I continue to knock on doors and I send emails and I continue to send emails and I don't give up. And, and, and if you want to make change happen, that's what it takes. And if you, the first person says no, you go to another person um, and you keep going until you get heard. Um, so, so that's where I'm coming from. And I'm, 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 uh, I, there are many people who have been so deeply traumatized and, and, and abused that, that they may not have that ability or have that voice and we need to stand up for them. So I, I would encourage everybody on the call who, who, who wants to take up that charge, you're welcome to email me <laughs> and others that are here on the call. And if you wanna help make change, the only way it's gonna happen is if we, if we make it happen. So I don't know if that answers the question completely, but that's, that's what I wanted to say. So. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Gloria, let me take that over to you. We talked a little bit about cultural differences between countries in responding to this issue. We heard from Paulina about differences in Poland. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about cultural differences here in the United States between communities of Catholics here in the United States. So Jennifer just said we need to stand up for people who don't have a voice. Do you find that happening in the U.S. on this issue and how can we do that? Oh yeah, I think actually of the example of some poor black men who were victims of clergy sexual abuse out of Mississippi. And even the way they were approached by the, the religious communities representative that approached them about what happened to them as children was in and of itself manipulative. He understood that they were poor. He gave them an extremely low ball offer to keep quiet. Also in their offer, um, their settlement, if you will, was a requirement that they never speak about their abuse and it was a lowball offer and he they, and the guy was saying to him well i don't i don't think this fifteen thousand dollars is really going to be enough and then the 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 priest who was representing his community uh basically said but you know then you have to get the lawyers involved and all these kind of things and so the additional manipulation of a community of people who are already poor underrepresented and really just don't have any understanding of how to go about even getting defense makes them uh, more vulnerable to this kind of manipulation i mean this was not even the priest that did the sexual abuse but then turned around and abused and manipulated this guy because his interests were not the healing and what was best for the victim, but how he could minimize what happened to his community. And in seeing success and being able to manipulate this man and to taking this terrible offer was his goal. And so that is something that's like just so, so different culturally wise, maybe even some communities don't even know how to go about in terms of the legal process, how to even get someone to represent them. Oh, you mean there is somebody that represents me and then not having the money maybe to pay them? It, 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 it makes uh, a, the level of um, vulnerability greater in some communities. And then also in the black community, most of us aren't actually Catholic. So being able to talk about that kind of experience in the wider community might not be understood as it is already 
with many communities where any kind of um, sexual abuse is sort of hush hush, you just don't talk about it. So there are a lot of um, other factors that come into play to make some communities even more vulnerable just by mere fact of not knowing how to go about and get the kind of representation and protection that is available. Thanks, Gloria. Jennifer, I saw you raise your hand there. Do you have something you want to say in response? Yeah, and um, I, I my story happened when my brother my brother was arrested on drug charges when he was um, 20, and um, it was the second time being arrested. And he was in jail and he was suicidal. And we didn't know what had happened to, to, to my brothers at that point. And my other brother finally disclosed because he was concerned my brother would kill himself in prison. And so I reached out to the church. That was the first place I reached out to for help. And at the time in the 90s, the way they handled it, they sent investigators and they were wearing priest clothes. So we thought that they were there to help us. And they took all our information and they ended up visiting my brother in, in prison and told him if he pressed his case, they would file blackmail charges against him. So, you know, I, I think that, again, um, you know, we were a poor family and so we were, we were vulnerable and discriminated against um, from, from the standpoint of being poor. And, um, and I cannot relate in any way, shape or form to what it's like being a minority in this country in that situation. I think it's, it's gotta be really, 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 really challenging. Um, and so, you know, we have to take care of the people that are vulnerable and in situations um, that can be exploited because of power and, and because their lack of access. So I, I, will, I will concur with you 100%, Gloria, that we have to be able to have mechanisms to speak up for, for the impoverished, the minorities, and, and, and people that don't have um, the means, so. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for, to, the, to you both for that. Now we're gonna turn to audience questions, questions from you all again. And please feel free to go to the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and type in your question. We'd love to hear from you. Paula, I wanna uh, combine a couple of questions that we've had from survivors' perspectives. One person asked, what's the youngest person you've ever talked to and maybe the oldest person? How have they, um, how do they talk about their abuse? Is that different? How are they handling it now? If you could share a little bit about those kinds of stories, maybe in a, obviously in a very general way, but also we have in, somebody who asked with the kind of anguish that you hear so much, um, a survivor says, as a survivor, our voice was silenced, our participation was not welcomed. Will we ever belong? What do you have to say to people who come to you with those kinds of questions? Um, okay, the, the youngest I've ever worked with is 27 years old and hers is within the last year that has happened as an adult. Um, it is, it, it's interesting because she goes back and forth between being a victim and not. And, you know, she says, I am just as culpable. I am just as responsible. And I try to tell her that it is never the victim's fault, that the priest is the one who has the boundary and he's the one that crossed it. You know, and she's 27 and he's 52. Um, the oldest one I've worked with is somebody who is 79, who just remembered recently, like in, within the last two years. And she was abused by a religious sister in second grade. And it just came back to her because she ran into the sister and the sister just ran away from her and she couldn't really, she didn't know why she ran away. But then when she, it was like six months later, she woke up one day and had all these memories of what the sister had done. So, you know, it's very common for them not to, um, you know, uh, reveal and or even remember. Um, what was the second part of your question, Kim? Somebody, somebody writes in and says, as a survivor, our voice was oh. silent, our participation was not welcomed. Will we ever belong? How do you, how, how does that feeling of belonging, what does that look like for you? When you, to um, the people you talk with? There was one, there was one um, victim survivor who talked to me about two months ago and she said, you know, I crave and hunger Eucharist. But she said, I can't sit foot in a church, but I crave Eucharist. I would go to use Eucharist except for who dispenses it. And I get it. And I understood that. And she said, I cannot set foot in the, inside the church yet. I want to be Catholic. And, you know, I almost think that for victims and survivors, it is, 
you know, being Catholic can look different for each person. You know, you have to do what you can do and that's enough. You know, right now, that's enough. And so if you want to be called Catholic, um, live the Catholic way of life. And if you can't receive the sacraments, that's, that's good enough for now. Doesn't mean it's going to be like that permanently, but it's good enough for now. And you do what you can do according to your, your healing. And, you know, it, it, we all know how much uh, sexual abuse by religious and priests affect the faith of a person. And many of them did not lose their, their faith in God, but they cannot set foot inside the church because the abuse happened in the church, in the church itself. So I don't know. It's so complicated, right? And I, yeah, I it is. Where you are, you just, I'm sure it, I can tell you receive people so well uh, in, in on these issues. Excuse me, everybody. Um, I also want to, I want to take some, jump off something you said, which leads to another question we just got. Someone says, course of silencing abuse is systemic, excluding women is a part of this. Um, and isn't an exclusive male priesthood being the only source of the sacrament of re reconciliation, also some an abuse of women? How do we respond to that? Lori, I wonder if you might take that. Yeah, um, I actually, the reason I don't think so, that, um, that the exclusive uh, male priesthood is an abuse of women is because women have a role. Um, it isn't as if we don't have a role in the church and it's the way Christ made it is that he had a male priesthood, but he also, God made it that all, all humans come from women. So we have a particular role, I think, that's exclusive to us as women that men don't have. And there's some, I think we need to spend more time recognizing the greatness of what it is that women bring rather than, um, and I see this in the secular world, things that men have or men are like not being able to get pregnant somehow becomes a model of perfection for women. And so I think we should change the framing on it. It's not that uh, the male priest didn't remember Jesus is involved. Jesus is there in the sacrament of reconciliation. That's who's there. What I think it underlines um, more so is how grave a sin it is when a priest who is a spiritual father abuses his children, because for some of them, it does mean that they are, as a matter of their trauma, uh, have to be to remove themselves from the sacrament of reconciliation, attending mass, anything where there's someone present as a, in a collar, as the priest. That to me ought to show us how gravely evil these horrific crimes, these sins that priests commit against people because of what it robs the victim of, not just the, the physical uh, violation, the emotional, but also the spiritual violation that happens where they themselves feel like, you know, the sacraments are not even safe, which makes the response of the bishops and those in charge even more important. And frankly, it makes them, in my opinion, it, when they come for judgment, have to face a lot more for what they have done. And so I don't think it's an abuse of women. I think it's an abuse of their role of spiritual fa fathers that has a negative consequence on, on victims. And, and, and by extension also, those people who aren't victims, but hear these things who are repulsed by the church and themselves separate themselves. So the issue that the priesthood is all male isn't the problem. It's the abuse of what God has given them that is the problem. Thanks so much for that. Uh, Jennifer, I might I wonder if you have a reaction to that. And also we have another question that says, how can we how can we support victim survivors without putting money in the collection basket? So I'd love to hear your thoughts and what we've heard, maybe about spiritual abuse as yeah. well, and then other ways to support victim survivors. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, and, and so uh, first of all, I thank you, Gloria, for your comments. Um, I, I wanna say that what's happened is a profound evil. Um, and, you know, I, I think if we really go back to the roots of, 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 of Christianity and, and what Christ taught us is that there is profound evil here and, um, and the evil that's working to erode the, the faith in the priesthood and to erode the faith in the church um, is profound. And it's something I want to guard against. I think um, I think that going into those waters and and and, and feeding into um, into that 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 level of discord. I'm not sure that that's productive at this point when we're talking about evil already. 
Um, and so I, and I, I have a very, you know, d- deeply spiritual sense about women's role and in, in, in the role that, that has been laid out for us. And I, and I concur, Corey, I think you said it brilliantly, so I'm not going to repeat it. Um, but I, 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 I agree. Um, in terms of the collection basket, it wasn't so much that they need money. Um, we, you know, money, I, I think I've always found earlier to one of the things that was said about justice, there is no justice. There is no justice on this planet that is ever going to give my brothers back their childhoods. There, that my, my brother's children's childhoods um, that have been robbed, my child, my, my, my adulthood of spending time with my family. There is no, there's just not enough justice on the planet. There's not enough money. There's not, not there, there, nobody can pay for what was taken from my family. Um, and what's been taken, what the faith has been taken from, from, from our church that, 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 that people have, there's not enough money. So I, I think what my point was, is that um, it was a lack of accountability. It was really, it was really going to, it doesn't matter how much money is put in that basket. The fact that people didn't want to deal with it and, and, and felt like they should just cut it out because they thought victims were getting so much money. The lawyers have made a lot of money. The lawyers have on both sides of the church. The lawyers for the church and the lawyers for the victims have made a lot of money over this, um, a lot more money than the victims have ever received. So um, what I want to see is I want people putting money in the basket to put programs together to, to help support victims. That's what I want. And um, and I, I will continue to ask for money to support victims, but it, it, it's not necessarily to get them rich. And it, they're just never going to be enough money that's going to fix what happened to my family. Thanks for that, Jennifer. Um, we had another question on the synod and synodality and how that works. And Gloria, I might wonder if I might go to you with that. The, the question I asked that this synod called by Pope Francis, which is this global listening session right around the world where we're asking for the church is asking for input from lay people around the world on how we can move forward as a mission centered church uh, with greater participation and in fact does respond on as part of a response to this clergy abuse crisis that we've been experiencing. So our listener asks, that seems to be a model for listening to reaching victim survivors um, and truly imagining a church at this historic time. What are your reactions to that? Do you see that in play as well? And I might, I wonder if we might go to you, Gloria, and then Paula, if you have any thoughts on that. So I, I'm not, are they asking about that the listening piece, because it includes this, that this is a good thing or? They're asking if this model of listening to lay people out there in parishes, listening to their concerns, is that kind of listening something that can be a model that the church uses oh, with victims, right? With victim oh, survivors. Oh yeah, I think any place that there is that they say, "Hey, we want to hear from you," right? That 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 indicates hopefully that there's this availability and willingness um, to listen. And not this kind of horrible things that Jennifer's family experienced, the stonewalling, if you will. But someone to say, please come and tell us, share your wounds with us. We want to be here with you. We want to listen. We're from a place of compassion, not from a place of we want to hear everything so we can get our defense together. You know what I mean? We're here for you because we want to hear from you and we want to heal because this is a wound on the entire church. So, yes, I think that is a model. Um, if they're saying, you know, if they're, if they're going to say to victim survivors or to survivors, I, I generally don't like the word victim because I think these people are heroic in their, in their surviving these horrible things that happened to them. So in hearing from these survivors and telling them, we want to hear from you, I think that's a whole different approach from coming in with lawyers or coming in with an investigator or coming in to gather information for the purpose of defending the church rather than just hearing from people because we want to hear from them. We want to learn from them and we want to help heal. Thanks so much for that. And Paula, right to you as well, sort of how does this model of listening, do you see that as something that could be effective that could happen at ground level, maybe is happening at ground level? We have one other question just to take the, take one last question and then we'll do a takeaway that I'll ask you to respond to. Someone is an archivist for a religious order and asks a really important question, whether the knowledge contained in such archives might be useful in generating therapeutic effects what is the role of gatekeepers? Maybe a larger question about transparency yeah. and how important you think that is. So if you yeah. could wrap those up for us and then we'll ask everybody for their final comment here. You know, I'm not sure. Um, I know you deal with the Synod too, Kim, don't you? Yeah. Bit, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if the Synod questions for the groups is the same across the United States. Do you know whether it is or not? 
there's there's a set of model questions, but obviously there's a lot of openness to how people okay. can I think what I see and what I have heard um, just by a couple of groups in our archdiocese is that it's, you know, the reality of the synod is that it's again controlled by the bishops versus controlled by the Holy Spirit. And I've heard that questions that are given with like multiple choice questions are very limited. Multiple choice is very limited. And two groups that I know of in my previous parish put that aside and wrote a letter to the bishop. And it was, it was great that they did that. You know, um, they were, and they mentioned, you know, what happened to the abuse crisis? What happened to clericalism? Why aren't we talking about this? You know, I, I really wish that it had been put together completely by the lady in the church. Um, as far as, you know, archives, I think every bit of it can be used is is very worthwhile in just the transparency that it, that it causes so yes i can see that being used and i would challenge you to to really think about how you're you are going to do that thanks so much thanks so much for mm -hmm. that and, and to be very clear on that it's you're absolutely right that things like multiple choice questions are not a, a great way to get at these kinds of answers but to those listening please know that you can send in your contributions mm -hmm. on this great listening process whatever they are to the usccb or if that's not comfortable for you send it on to the vatican send it to a trusted yep. network that you trust um, if they have mechanisms for getting it forward, if you're not comfortable with either mm -hmm. of those groups, uh, because it really is important to raise up the voices of survivors here. That's right. something that's central. So thank yeah. you so much for that, Paula. And thank you're all welcome. of you. I want to go around and ask you, uh, and maybe we'll start with you, Paula, and then Jennifer, and then Gloria. What's one thing you want viewers to take away from this conversation today? It's been such a rich conversation. Let's start, Paula. You know, I, I, I think... In order for women's roles to change, you know, in the, this, we have to change the systemic flaws. What's wrong with our church, with our hierarchy? We have to go deep. We, we can't go surface. Um, the other thing my motto has become with the work that I do, I cannot save the world, but I can, I can change my one small part of it. So. Thanks so much. Jennifer, how about you? One takeaway for everyone. I think there's hope. I think there's hope. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. Gloria, how about yourself? What's your takeaway from our conversation today? Oh yeah, I think that um, we are one half of humanity that needs a bigger mic a megaphone, if you will. And I don't think the solution though is to make us um, in, the in the model of men. We need to explore more deeply the specific, specific gifts that women have. And let's not try to fit us into a pattern for men. Rather, let's explore the beauty, wonder, awesomeness as we are as women. And that's what the church is missing. Thank you so much. I want to thank you all. I want to thank Paulina Gusick. Paula Kampfner, Gloria Purvis, and Jennifer Wortham for being a part of this important conversation on lifting up female voices in the church. Thank all of you for joining us here as well. And thanks especially to Father Jerry McGlone and our colleagues at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs for all they did to organize this conference on clergy sexual abuse in the Catholic Church, listening to the voices of survivors, and to all who collaborated on this important effort. Most of all, thank you all for watching, and we look forward to having you join our conversations in the future.